Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining. So the letters of Van Gogh go from uh, 1875 up till 1890. So he died fairly young in 1890. And there are about 600 letters that he sent to Theo. So this is Van Gogh, an old photo of Van Gogh as a young man on the left and his brother Theo on the right. Some were also sent to his sister, um, Will. And amazingly, <laughs> Vincent was the kind of person that didn't save really that much. So only a few letters survive that came in for Vincent. But Theo, his brother, who lived in Paris for much of his life as an art dealer, was a hoarder, especially for paper. He would save all kinds of bits of paper. And partly because of him, we have all of these amazing insights into this artist's life. Theo's wife, Joanna, pictured here with their son, also called, um, yeah. So Joanna also saved the letters and she actually had them published. So they got actually properly published in 1914, a few decades after Vincent's death. It's quite amazing that the letters survive. There are hardly any other artists from this period, such famous artists or such artists with such an impact, whose private life, intensely private life, still survives in such complete form. So it's really quite, quite incredible. So I wanted to start up when Vincent is in The Hague in 1882. He's been through a series of things in his life, different kinds of education in art, different kinds of jobs. He was intensely religious in the 1870s and worked out in the mining areas of Belgium. He was a real character. He got fired a lot of the time because of intense differences between him and the person, between the boss. And I wanted to pick up in The Hague in 1882 when one of his failed relationships, so he really didn't have much luck with romantic relationships. And partly out of pity, he took on this woman here in the picture you can see on the left and her child. He took pity on them, he took them in, but it really didn't work very well. And eventually he was partly forced by his family who were very religious to leave her but also for himself. And he also commented later on in his life, in his letters, that he was so unlucky in love, he just chose the wrong people the whole time. But I wanted to start with this because even though it's a bit of a morbid start, I find it a brilliant insight into something quite integral and continuous in his life, which is something intensely sensitive and very much in tune with compassion, if you like, or the suffering of other people, the suffering of himself, and the want to express that, to alleviate that. So this is to Theo from 1882, from The Hague. And this is about this drawing and other drawings. What I want and have as my aim is infernally difficult to achieve. And yet I think I am raising my sights too high. I want to make drawings that touch some people Sorrow is a small beginning. There is at least something straight from my own heart in it. What I want to express in both figure and landscape isn't anything sentimental or melancholy, but deep anguish. In short, I want to get to the point where people say of my work, that man feels deeply, that man feels keenly. What am I in the eyes of most people, a non-entity, an eccentric or an unpleasant person, somebody who has no position in society and never will have, in short, lowest of the low. All right then, even if that were absolutely true, then I should one day like to show by my work what such an eccentric, such a nobody has in his heart. That is my ambition, based less on resentment than on love based more on a feeling of serenity than on passion. 
Though I am often in the depths of misery, there is still calmness, pure harmony and music inside me. I see paintings or drawings in the poorest cottages, in the dirtiest corners, and my mind is driven towards these things with an irresistible momentum. For a lot of his younger life, he was drawing with charcoal, for example, or pencil, as we saw in the last images. One of his first color paintings is this seascape. So it's called Beach at Chevignan in stormy weather. And it's while he was in Chevignan as a day trip from The Hague in 1882, again to his brother. This week I painted something which I believe may give some idea of the impression of Scheveningen as we saw it when we walked there together. A large study of sand, sea, sky. A big sky of delicate grey and warm white through which an occasional spot of soft blue shines. The sand and the sea light. So that the whole becomes blonde though enlivened by the bold and distinctively coloured figures and pinks which take on tone. There is something infinite in painting. I cannot explain it to you so well, but it is so delightful just for expressing one's feelings. There are hidden harmonies or contrasts in colours which involuntarily combine to work together and which could not possibly be used in any other way. This is a great insight into one of these aspects of Van Gogh's paintings, which came to be called post-impressionism, because through his use of colors, he's trying to create some kind of emotional connection with the subject. And this goes a bit beyond what the impressionists, what the French realists were doing at the time, when it was more about the image itself. Whereas Van Gogh's sort of strange, warped personality that was intensely focused and intensely intense, <laughs> sorry for my lack of vocabulary there, was infatuated with trying to create some deeper reality using colors, using the, the actual soul and the psyche of the artist to imbue the subject with a deeper reality. And then this uh, charcoal sketch three figures near a canal with windmill, also from this time in Chevignan in 18, this is in 1883 to Theo. For no particular reason, I cannot help adding a thought that often occurs to me. Not only did I start drawing relatively late in life, but it may well be that I shall not be able to count on many more years of life either. The world concerns me only in so far as I owe it certain debt and duty, so to speak, because I have walked this earth for 30 years and out of gratitude would like to leave some memento in the form of drawings and paintings, not made to please this school or that, but to express a genuine human feeling. That is how I regard myself as having to accomplish in a few years something full of heart and love, and to do it with a will. Should I live longer, so much the better. But I put that out of my mind. Something must be accomplished in those few years. This thought guides all my plans. So in 1885, he moved in with his parents in Nuenen in the Netherlands. And he was there for a couple of years and he became infatuated, obsessed with drawing the working class. He had this, he felt a deep connection with the working class that they provided this insight into a purer world, something where the people are in much more harmony with the land as opposed to the big cities that were developing all over Europe, there's still this rural world where everything is in a way much more simple. 
And he did many, many, many drawings and studies for this painting, The Potato Eaters, which for a long time afterwards, he considered his best work. It actually got exhibited in Paris by his brother, Theo. And Vincent wrote to him and said, sorry, you're not doing enough to, to sell this. It's not selling. And Theo wrote back and said, well, people aren't interested in all of these dark colors and these rough peasant figures. This was the age of impressionism in Paris, these bright sort of fanciful colors. So this was kind of really the wrong time for this painting in a way. And this is what he wrote about it to his brother in 1885. You see, I really have wanted to make it so that people get the idea that these folk who are eating their potatoes by the light of their little lamp have tilled the earth themselves with these hands they are putting in the dish. And so it speaks of manual labor and that they have thus honestly earned their food. I wanted to give the idea of a wholly different way of life from ours, civilized people. So I certainly don't want everyone just to admire it or approve of it without knowing why. If you look, for example, at the hands and the studies that he made of these hands to try and bring across this physicality, this rustic, muddy, potato smelling hands of these of these uh, lower class at the time. Sorry. So in 1886, he moves to Paris. But one of the, the ironies of this is that we don't have the letters from this time because he was staying with his brother Theo. So it's a kind of blank period in his life. But in Paris, he gets in touch with color, the colors of the Impressionists for the first time. This is a real change in his work where the Van Gogh that we all tend to know is these bright yellows and blues and purples and reds. So this is um, regarding this painting. This is the same day that he's talking about this painting to, to his brother Theo from, um, from Paris in 1887. And I included this because it's an insight into his romantic life, given his past situations of failed relationships. I feel I'm losing the desire for marriage and children. And at times I'm quite melancholy to be like that at 35, when I ought to feel quite differently. And sometimes I blame this damn painting. It was Rich Pin who said somewhere, the love of art makes us lose real love. I find that terribly true. But on the other hand, real love puts you right off art. To succeed, you have to have ambition and ambition seems absurd to me. I don't know what will come of it. Most of all, I'd like to be less of a burden to you. And that's not impossible from now on because I hope to make progress in such a way that you'll be able to show what I'm doing with confidence without compromising yourself. This is a recurring theme in his letters, in his life, where he feels this shame, this guilt, that he hasn't got his own job, that he hasn't got his own income from his art. There's this pressure he has inside to fulfill some kind of role within the family, within the society, to be a successful person, financially, essentially. And uh, it's something that may have led to his, his, his breakdown in the end that he could never really make this work. And from a similar time, but not from this letter, there's this quote about color when he discovers this new world of color in Paris. There are colors that make each other shine, that make a couple complete each other like man and wife. This intense fascination with how color itself can invoke different emotions within the viewer and as they're coupled together in different ways can create more complex and subtle reactions.
more from his color time in Paris. And I tried to choose some paintings which are not so well known as well as some of the more well known, just to give you a, a kind of a deeper insight. So, so not just kind of the glorious paintings, the famous paintings. So, um, sorry, I, I got this um, this quote wrong down here. This is from his, his Paris years in 1887 to his brother Theo, though. Of my own work, I think that the picture of peasants eating potatoes I did in Nuenen is, après tout, above all, the best I've done. But since then, I've had no chance of getting models. Though, on the other hand, I did have the chance to study the colour question. And if I should find models again for my figures later, then I would hope to be able to show that I am after something other than little green landscapes or flowers. Last year I painted almost nothing but flowers so as to get used to colours other than grey, pink, soft or bright green, light blue, violet, yellow, orange, glorious red. So he's discovering this new palette of colours, this new range of colours. But as we saw earlier in this letter, he's fascinated with portraits. So all through his letters, there's this constant reference to, I wish I could paint more portraits. He gets immensely excited about portraiture. This was much more exciting to him than landscapes, which is in a way one of the more famous things about his work is these glorious kind of washy landscapes. But he was more fascinated in portraiture, which I'll touch on a bit later. So he moves to um, Arles in, in 1888, which is an area in the south of France. This picture was the, the, the yellow house which he moves into, this famous yellow house seen in an old black and white photo. It's now not there anymore. And this is a, a famous period of his increasing breakdown, mental breakdown. For example, Gauguin, Paul Gauguin, the artist, comes to stay with him. Vincent has this idea of creating an artist community, but that doesn't work out. And potentially because of this tumultuous relationship with Gauguin, he then cuts his ear off and gives it to a prostitute in a local cafe. So there's this increased insecurity in his character, a um, developing of his mental instability, but an increase in his color fascination. At the moment, I am absorbed in the blooming fruit trees, pink peach trees, yellow white pear trees. My brush stroke has no system at all. I hit the canvas with irregular touches of the brush, which I leave as they are. Patches of thickly laid on color, spots of canvas left uncovered. Here or there portions that are left absolutely unfinished. Repetitions, savageries. In short, I'm inclined to think that the result, it's so disquieting and irritating as to be a godsend to those people who have preconceived ideas about technique. This is an, a, a sentiment of all of these revolutions in art where people face some kind of wall in their world, their cultural artistic world but they choose to batter through it or to see things in a different way. And it gets met with criticism. And this is a key aspect of post-impressionism is taking art beyond something formal where even with the impressionists, they were still expected to have some sense of bodily form, some sense of, of um, perspective. Whereas with Van Gogh, he's saying, I would just sort of spontaneously lay on the colors. So it's something very new at the time. While in Arles, he takes a trip to Saint-Marie-de-la-Mer, which is on the, the coast of the south coast of France. And if you compare this seascape to the first one I showed you when it's all grays and sort of darky brown blues, this is a completely different kind of expression. It's so much more full of vibrancy and color and, and depth. I am at last writing to you from Saint-Marie on the shore of the Mediterranean. 
The Mediterranean has the colors of mackerel, changeable, I mean. You don't always know if it's green or violet. You can't even say it's blue because the next moment the changing light has taken on a tinge of pink or gray. This was one aspect of the Impressionists that touched Van Gogh, that they would go out and actually paint in the open air. And someone like Monet, for example, with these haystacks, this famous haystack paintings, he would go out at say 6 p.m. and paint a haystack. But by 7 p.m., the light had changed. So he would have another canvas next to it where he would be painting that haystack an hour later and it would be subtly or completely different. This, this fascination with, with light and the, the, this, this depth in art, this increased depth and flexibility into, into what art means. So this is a letter to his sister from 1888. The painting is self-portrait as a painter. So this is him describing this own self-portrait. A pinkish gray face with green eyes, ash colored hair, wrinkles on the forehead and around the mouth, stiff wooden, a very red beard, considerably neglected and mournful. But the lips are full, a blue peasant's blouse of coarse linen and a palette with citron yellow, vermilion, macolite green, cobalt blue, in short, all the colors on the palette except the orange beard, but only whole colors. The figure against a grayish white wall. It isn't an easy job to paint oneself, at any rate, if it is to be different from a photograph. And you see, this in my opinion is the advantage that Impressionism possesses over all the other things. It's not banal and one seeks after a deeper resemblance than the photographers. So in a way, a self-explanatory point there that one of the aims of a more modern art that Van Gogh was living through was this desire to see deeper into the person and to put that onto a canvas. In the past, there were these highly flung, very noble portraits of kings and dukes but he wants to do something different, different from that idealized art, but also different from the realities of photography, something much more integral, something tapping into the very soul of the person that you're looking at and painting. Just round the corner from his yellow house in Arles was this cafe. And we may see this painting as something very idyllic, something, you know, bringing into your senses the feeling of Paris in the nighttime, something very romantic. But actually his description of the cafe shows something very different. So this is from 1888, again, in Arles to his brother. Today, I'm probably going to start on the interior of the cafe where I'm staying in the evening by gaslight. It's what they call a night cafe here. They stay open all night. This way the night prowlers can find a refuge when they don't have the price of a lodging or if they're too drunk to be admitted. All these things, family, native country, are perhaps more appealing in the imagination of such as us who do fairly well without a native country as well as a family than in any reality. It always seems to me that I'm a traveler who's going somewhere and to a destination. If I say to myself, the somewhere, the destination doesn't exist at all. That seems well argued and truthful to me. And at the end of my career, I'll be wrong. So be it. Then I'll find that not only the fine arts, but the rest as well were nothing but dreams, that we were nothing at all ourselves. If we're as lightweight as that, so much the better for us. 
as nothing would then stand in the way of the limitless possibility of future existence. I find that a very beautiful quote, looking at these people who are apparently so without a home and without a solid ground, but actually the people who think that they have this solid ground and imagine that they have a solid ground are perhaps in exactly the same position as these apparent night prowlers. Everyone moving around the world. And if they think they have some great destination at the end, that's equally as an illusion as these people who are drunk and just looking for one night to shelter somewhere. That cafe still exists today. The home of Vincent doesn't exist anymore. So today, I think it's sort of an ice cream parlor. It has none of the sort of um, brothel-like dive dive bar scene that it held in Van Gogh's time. And on that same theme is a similar painting from inside the cafe, which again, you might see as an insight into a fancy Parisian rural cafe. Oh, it's so lovely. But again, the quote is very different. What Vincent actually saw in it and what he was trying to do with his playing the colors against each other. So this is about the night cafe. In my painting of the night cafe, I've tried to express the idea that the cafe is a place where you can ruin yourself, go mad, commit crimes. Anyway, I tried with contrasts of delicate pink and blood red and wine red, soft Louis XV and Veronese green contrasting with yellow greens and hard blue greens. All of that in an ambiance of a hellish furnace, a pale sulphur. I tried to express the terrible passions of humanity with red and green. And yet, with the appearance of Japanese gaiety. So what is this Japanese reference? Well, before Van Gogh went to Paris in The Hague, but also in Paris, he came in touch with a burgeoning art scene where they had these huge influences from Japan. And they were looking at these panels from famous Japanese artists like Hiroshiga, where it's very simple in a way. There's no there's no high-flung shading or depth to the painting, you know, layered oils like the Renaissance or something like this. It's just this clear, gentle slap in the face, like a fresh breath of air. You can see this comparison here, this influence that these Japanese artists had on Van Gogh. He loved this simplicity, this transparency in their paintings. And here again, this, this Japanese gaiety, this lightness to the Japanese paintings. This is an original Japanese painting, and here is Van Gogh's copy of it. And then this quote here from him about the influence of Japan on him. Isn't it almost a new religion that these Japanese teach us? who are so simple and live in nature as if they themselves were flowers. And we wouldn't be able to study Japanese art, it seems to me, without becoming much happier and more cheerful. And it makes us return to nature, despite our education and our work in a world of convention. Ah, oh, I envy the Japanese the extreme clarity that everything in their work has. It's never dull never appears to be done too hastily. Their work is as simple as breathing, and they do a figure with a few confident strokes with the same ease as if it was as simple as buttoning your waistcoat. So this painting, again from 1888 in, in Arles, so this is two years before his death, the mental instability has become very pronounced, potentially something like um, epilepsy, but perhaps something just more general that we would today call just mental health problems, you know, 
overly ideal images of where you want to be in your life contrasting with what's actually happening, which causes suffering. <laughs> There's a potential strain in that too. Um, but he does report proper attacks, which would seem to be something more like epilepsy. The bedroom in Arles. So this was in the yellow house where he was living. And it's one of the most pure explorations of how colors can work to create a feeling that Van Gogh did, which is something very modern for the time, hence part of his label as a post-impressionist. So this is how he describes it. This time, it's just simply my bedroom. Only here color is to do everything and giving by a simplification a grander style to things is to be suggestive here of rest or of sleep in general. In a word, looking at the picture ought to rest the brain or rather the imagination. The walls are pale violet, the floor is of red tiles, the wood of the bed and chairs is the yellow of fresh butter, the sheets and pillows very light greenish citron, the coverlet scarlet, the window green, the toilet table orange, the basin blue, the doors lilac, and that is all, only flat colours in harmony. If you read his letters, in almost every one where he's describing a painting, there's just, he goes into the colours in such detail. There's this fascination with, with colour and how colour can, can affect the soul. So he had a pretty severe breakdown in 88 and 89, 1888 and 1889, and he went further north from Arles to Saint-Rémy, which was a, uh, a mental institution. And he then lived there for some time, but still painted feverishly in between his breakdowns. And he lived in this cell and you can still go to that cell and look out through these bars onto his view from that cell. We'll get back to that cell in a second, but this painting is very interesting because it's one of the most imaginative of Van Gogh's, Van Gogh's paintings. There doesn't really seem to be this view around the, the hospital where he was. This seems to be something more imagined. And you can see in the sky that, I mean, he didn't see this. You don't see these swirls in the sky. This is something more sort of psycho, psychoactive, sort of more from the imagination than actually just what you see. And he's usually very obsessed with what you can see. He's not like Gauguin, for example, who was trying to create paintings from the imagination to try and bring up feelings of joy for the primitive state of man, for example, a previous era, and to put that onto the painting. So this is a fairly unique instance where Van Gogh seems to be doing that. And this comes up in this letter that he writes from Saint-Rémy in 1889 to his brother. At last I have a landscape with olive trees and also a new study of the starry sky. Although I haven't seen the latest canvases either by Gauguin or Bernard, I'm fairly sure that those, these two studies I speak of are comparable in sentiment. When you've seen these two studies for a while, as well as the one of the ivy, I'll perhaps be able to give you, better than in words, an idea of the things Gauguin, Bernard and I sometimes chatted about and that preoccupied us. It's not a return to the romantic or to religious ideas, no. However, by going the way of Delacroix, more than it seems, by colour and a more determined drawing than Tronloy precision, one might express a country nature that is purer than the suburbs, the bars of Paris. So what this shows is this person who's so interested in trying to do something new He's going beyond the really abstract imagination of someone like Gauguin, but he's also dabbling in Delacroix, who was a very romantic 
painter and painted idealized scenes of romantic myth and folklore. And he's going somewhere in between them. He's trying to create this feeling of an idyllic countryside, which, which is in itself idyllic, but also makes you reminisce about an older age, a more simpler, purer age. But just the colors, it's so, it's such a early stage of abstract art, when obviously this isn't what you see in the sky. This is a, a heightened feeling, a heightened expression of how you feel. Quite, quite amazing. He also loved cypress trees, this tree here. He found them re reminiscent of these perfect obelisk forms from, from ancient Egypt. Very mystical subjects for him. And this is really, I, I really, I really love this painting partly because of its context, because this is painted from the cell. So if you remember that, that cell view from before, he's looking out from his window of this mental asylum onto this little patch of land. And from that, he creates this painting. And I'll read you what he wrote about it. I think it's really, really amazing. Called Wheatfield with a Reaper. He's in between mental breakdowns and when he paints he's usually quite stable and after he paints he often would go into a, a relapse. Work is going quite well. I'm struggling with a canvas begun a few days before my indisposition. A reaper. The study is all yellow, terribly thickly impasted, but the subject was beautiful and simple. I then saw in this reaper a vague figure struggling like a devil in the full heat of the day to reach the end of his toil. I then saw the image of death in it, in this sense that humanity would be the wheat being reaped. But in this death, nothing sad. It takes place in broad daylight with the sun that floods everything with a light of fine gold. Good. Here I am again. However, I'm not letting go and I'm trying again on a new canvas. This inevitability of suffering and despair. Anyway, here I am again, recovered for a period. I'm thankful for it. Ah, oh, I could almost believe that I have a new period of clarity ahead of me. This painting is almost a, pre a, a preceding movement to, to symbolism, where these symbolist painters wanted to imbue nature with human sentiment or things that the person sees in nature, which go beyond the actual view itself and are symbols for some kind of deeper truth. I find this painting an amazing early example of that from, from his own words. And just a pure quote here, because I find it a great insight into his, into his mental state uh, a year before he, before he dies. This is to his sister. I am unable to describe exactly what is the matter with me. Now and then there are horrible fits of anxiety, apparently without cause, or otherwise a feeling of emptiness and fatigue in the head times I have attacks of melancholy and of atrocious remorse. Every day I take the remedy which the incomparable Dickens prescribes against suicide. It consists of a glass of wine, a piece of bread with cheese, and a pipe of tobacco. He then goes on in this letter to say, don't take life too seriously, and I'm trying not to take life too seriously. So he's describing these fits of melancholy, but he's saying, I try not to indulge them too much. I just try to, to move on. So 1890, this is the last year of his life. He takes his life in the end of July, 1890, apparently by suicide, by a gunshot wound to the chest. There's lots of speculation about that, but 
that's probably for a different talk. This painting, Almond Blossoms, very reminiscent of Japanese painting. And this was done when his brother Theo had a child who was also called Vincent after Vincent. There's some suggestion that because of his brother having a child, Vincent went into an overdrive of mental anguish because his brother was his lifeline. His brother was so dear to him and was so connected with him to the family, the sense of upholding a kind of family goodness and being successful within the family, that when his brother started in Vincent's eyes, perhaps to disappear into his family, this could have triggered some kind of relapse. And you see that a bit with this painting because after he painted this, he writes that he completely collapsed. But I'm picking up this letter again to try and write. It will come little by little. It's just that my mind has been so affected. Without pain, it's true, but totally stupefied. And so I almost or entirely despair of myself. Work was going well. The last canvas of the branches in blossom. You'll see that it was perhaps the most patiently worked best thing I had done, painted with calm and a greater sureness of touch. And the next day done for like a brute. Difficult to understand things like that, but alas, that's how it is. Often when he was painting from his letters, he talks about this great elation, this enormous joy and connectedness. And then after that came this exact opposite of depression and lethargy and suicidal thoughts, especially in the last couple of years of his life. But it's important not to remember Van Gogh as someone who was sort of always depressed and a depressive. He was perhaps more something like bipolar in a sense, going from these extremes of this intense elation, intense connectedness, fervor, drive to just the exact opposite. I mentioned earlier about portrait, how he was so obsessed with portraits and he found this much more exciting than any of his other work. This is of Dr. Gachet, who this painting recently sold for hundreds of millions <laughs> a few years ago. This is after Saint-Rémy, this is after this mental asylum when he moves further north nearer to Paris, a place called auvers sur and Dr. Gachet was a kind of therapist who had experience with dealing with artists who were having these mental and emotional problems. And this is what Van Gogh writes about this portrait. What excites me most, far, far more than any part of my craft, is portraiture, modern portraiture. I should like to paint portraits that a century later will seem like apparitions. I painted a portrait of Mr. Gachet with an expression of melancholy, which would seem to look like a grimace to many who saw the canvas. And yet it is necessary to paint it like this for otherwise one could not get an idea of the extent to which in comparison with the calmness of the old portraits, there is expression in our modern heads and passion, like a kind of expectation or a certain vintage quality, sad and yet gentle, but clear and intelligent. That's how many portraits ought to be painted. So this is from one of the last, um, from one of the last letters of his life. This is to Theo and his sister in Paris. Um, and this is from this town quite near Paris called auvers sur from 1890. This is actually a couple of weeks before he takes his own life. Once back here, oh, sorry, a bit of context to this letter. A few days before he had been in Paris with Theo and Joe and then and their child. And he had been 
helping to to look after them and just visiting and also he was seeing people who were interested in him there were artists who were interested in his work by this time and they wanted to see him and he tried to see them he tried to entertain them and be sociable and stuff like this but he couldn't he couldn't do it he had a kind of panic attack and ran away from Paris and left out into the countryside and there are these very sad letters after he dies from Joe, Theo's wife, who says, God, if only I was nicer to him, if only we were more compassionate at that time. So he runs away from Paris and goes back into the countryside, which was where he had found this, this relief from other people. He, he, he often writes about hating other artists or hating other, hating the art world for trying to make commodities out of art and just to sell it because it's a, a piece of a piece of cash in the making so he goes back into the countryside and writes this letter about this painting once back here i set to work again the brush however almost falling from my hands and knowing clearly what i wanted I've painted another three large canvases since then. There are immense stretches of wheat fields under turbulent skies. And I made a point of trying to express sadness, extreme loneliness. You'll see this soon, I hope, for I hope to bring them to you in Paris as soon as possible. Since I'd almost believe that these canvases will tell you what I can't say in words what I consider healthy and fortifying about the countryside. I have been completely absorbed by that endless plain with fields of wheat against the hills, as vast as the sea. I am altogether in a mood of almost too great composure, in a mood to paint this. It's like one last glimpse of this intense fervor and passion and depth to this artist contrasted with his obvious anxiety, emotional, mental, perhaps just physical problems. It's really, really amazing. To add a bit to the sadness, sorry, but um, a year after Vincent died, his brother Theo was, well, sorry, when Vincent died, his brother Theo was completely distraught. He was completely destroyed by this. And a year later, he himself died in 1891. His wife, Jo, who actually collected the letters and edited them and organized them by dates as much as she could and published them in 1914 properly said that in this year he was just in irreconcilable it was it was horrible for him included in that were these feelings of guilt that the last time they saw him it hadn't been very hadn't been a very nice time there were all kinds of stressful instances but i guess one interesting aspect of this is that Vincent doesn't seem to have been a very easy guy to actually live with or to work with. There's this famous saying, everyone wants a Van Gogh in their living room, but no one wants Van Gogh in their living room. So you've also got to take it with this pinch of salt, you know, not this lovely character who was just sort of tragically you know, uh, cursed by this illness. He was also a really intense person who was very, very, very stubborn. And um, there's almost something on the, in the realm of sort of Asperger's or autism with this intense, um, this intense focus on one's own world. You know, this really, really, really intense focus on one's own passions. The touching thing is that they're buried together in Auvergne in the south of France. Ici repose Vincent, so here lies Vincent and here lies Theo. Oh, 
<laughs> I meant to put that later. Anyway, sorry, that's the end of the tour. Um, I finished a little bit a little bit early. I thought I had actually overplanned, but I haven't. So um, yes. That's the end of the tour. Thank you very much for joining. Um,